one second one second i'll get back to you abhilash abhilash sir no ടെക്നിക്കൽ <laughs> 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 സോ ടീച്ചറെ നമുക്ക് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ചെയ്യാം അല്ലെ ലെവൻ തേർട്ടി ഇറ്റ്സ് ലെവൻ തേർട്ടി തേർട്ടി ചെയ്യാം സാറ് ഞാൻ പക്ഷെ ഓൺ ദ വേ ആണ് കേട്ടോ ഞാൻ തന്നത് ചെയ്താ മതി ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് എവ്രി വൺ ഐം ജസ്റ്റ് ഐം ഇൻവൈറ്റിംഗ് അവർ ഡിഗ്നിറ്ററി ടുഡേ ഡോക്ടർ ശ്രീജി പണിക്കർ ഇറ്റ്സ് അവർ പ്രിവിലേജ് ടു ഹാവ് യു ആസ് എൻ ഇനാഗറൽ സ്പീക്കർ ഫോർ ദി സി എസ് വിസിറ്റിംഗ് ഫാക്കൽറ്റി പ്രോഗ്രാം um anyway uh, uh, you know time is very limited so i'm just going to uh, an introduction by dr kavita palakrishnan coordinator for the program so she will give a brief idea about uh, dr shivji panike and then uh, 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 he'll uh, uh, i mean go to the presentation so uh, welcoming everyone again thank you thank you all i think professor abhilash may say uh, that hello a very good morning to all of you uh, welcoming uh, one and all joining for this first lecture in our series art in transit we have today with us the renowned art historian professor dr shivji panika to conduct this lecture i know the introduction yet uh, let me just beg your attention to some important details we all wish to share about him Her PhD work on Sakta Matrikas, a study of art and attitudes under the guideship of Dr. Gretchen Parimu in the early 80s in MS University, Bangalore, is the second in the PhD. He was professor and head of the art. that the revised syllabi and post structure for ngee and in the art history is there and he was coordinator for ugc ai hss program in the middle of all these activities uh, and visionary academic life unfortunately in 2007 he was suspended from all job positions from msu for standing up with all his convictions for university's autonomy and against the right wing fundamentalist intrusions into the affairs of the faculty definitely that was part of defending his student against such invaders too chipchi but regained all his academic life against all these odds in 2010 he was one of the project coordinators for uh, the five traveling workshops leading to a colloquium um, on the theme curating indian visual culture theory and practice which is an initiative um, of india foundation uh, in the um, india foundation for arts in bangalore um, actually from 2011 july to october 2014 he was dean school of culture and creative expressions ambedkar university delhi 
and um, currently he is a faculty for the postgraduate diploma course on modern and contemporary art and cultural studies I mean curatorial studies uh, dr baudar gulad mumbai city museum mumbai his major titles include saptamatrika worship and sculptures and the landmark edited volumes in our history include articulating resistance art and activism 20th century indian sculpture towards a new art history currently he is joining us from baroda his major engagement now is with cure theory activism and culture practice shivji has throughout been an inspiring teacher who always always unsettles the soil beneath you and push you towards critical thinking warm welcome shivji let me invite you whole heartedly invite you to the session thank you abhilash thank you very much uh, for this warm welcome <coughs> i also would like to thank uh, manoj uh, professor manoj kannan and dr kavita balashram for their invitation to present this lecture am i audible am i audible hello yeah, yeah. yes sir yes, 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 yes you are audible okay fine i uh, this uh, <clears throat> shall i just start uh, with your kind of permission i'm uh, going to start the presentation without uh, wasting any time <coughs> <coughs> now <coughs> sorry uh, 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 first of all i would like to uh, say that this is a very preliminary very primary level introductory level uh, presentation uh, so those who are expecting high level uh, uh, anything uh, theory or discussion uh, you will have to bear with us uh, for today so this is actually meant for those who are entering the uh, uh, ba course as i i i presume uh, uh, at least it is meant for the ba level Uh, because this college uh, uh, intrature uh, college of fine arts intrature is a uh, undergraduate college if i am not wrong so uh, uh, probably there will be future uh, possibilities of uh, uh, sharing more uh, specialized presentations with all of you so i would like to kind of uh, 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 share the uh, my my uh, uh, uh presentation right away is it visible hello is my ppt present uh, uh, visible hello no yes, no yes sir you can see Uh, is it possible no 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 sir uh no sir you have to start the presentation yeah i have started the presentation i have gone to the mm, what do you call that share share window share window share window on uh once again i'm trying share window a tab a window you are at a screen what should i press a window or a enter screen enter screen okay now acha now share now visible yes visible yeah, yeah. okay fine great so uh, basic uh, title is uh, basic categories and terminologies in visual art and uh, we are going to uh, look at uh, uh, world art history uh, from this uh, proposed title right at the outset i would like to define um, art before we go into any uh, further discussions uh, you know in common parlance art refers to creative expressions in general 
That is to say that uh, when you use the word art in your conversation or in your writing, it simply refers to anything that is artful, anything that is uh, nicely made, creatively made. It, so it could be referring to gardening, it could be referring to cooking, it could be referring to anything related to any creative uh, expression. Now, so that is why uh, uh, we should first of all understand that where you are in uh, to study art uh, is actually a human faculty. What we call as creativity is a basic human faculty which is endowed for uh, with human beings uh, compared to the in comparison to the animal world uh, because it's a very special kind of uh, ability to create something look at it uh, critically appreciate uh, 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 critically you know appraise it and then kind of make uh, changes so there is a process of uh, creativity that is involved. So this is including all kinds of creative expressions, creative ways, science or um, technology or various fields. Uh, in almost all human endeavor, creativity is a basic, uh, you know, uh, basic, uh, basic uh, requirement. So, uh, so this is actually what we mean. Human development then is uh, concerned with creative thinking in general. One can say, right? So, uh, when but when we talk about art with capital A, as you can see in this particular uh, sentence that I projected to you, uh, more specifically, when we call it as art, when we say art with capital A. That capital A is very important. It's not just simply art. It is uh, so-called, what we mean by art, refers to the, uh, not only creativity, but also to institutions and modes of making various uh, objects, various uh, things that are considered to be art. So these are creative practices at various uh, uh, almost all human societies across uh, uh, across geographical locations and various periods all over uh, uh, you find art which is considered to be a separate autonomous space which is different from uh, anything that is practical uh, uh, oriented like say garden making or uh, weaving or eat or even uh, cooking or various other or perfume making etc etc so art with capital a that we consider uh, from today's perspective it refers to the institution that holds this practice you know and uh, various modes of practices there's constant change constant uh, 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 innovations being done in the modes of making also. So on a basic level, <clears throat> what we mean art or art with capital A is understood in terms of mediumistic spe specificity. That is to say that uh, we are specifically concerned about visual art, uh, but we of course also have other art forms like uh, dance, music, cinema, literature, theater. So these are all various uh, branches of uh, art making. Each one of having, each one having their own specific uh, mediumistic uh, uh, specificity and a certain autonomy is uh, practiced and exercised by each one of these, uh, you know, specific uh, uh, media. Now, all these uh, practices, whether it is literature, uh, theater, dance, music, uh, they all belong to something what is generally called as culture. Now, you often use culture, samskaram in Malayalam, uh, uh, is actually uh, something that is we take it for granted because we are born into culture. We are born into cultures rather. So 
this culture is something that is constantly kind of uh, uh, educating us, orienting us towards particular uh, practices. Culture is uh, defined as set of uh, shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes a period. So there is a there is a culture of a period. So it is constantly changing also. It refers to various institutions, definitely, that because, for instance, temple is, a, is an institution that uh, uh, propagates a particular kind of uh, culture. It also demands a certain particular kind of organizational uh, setup. And more importantly, also, it addresses itself to a group or community. So the definition of culture that art belongs to, art caters or art, art feeds into uh, a larger field called culture, right? And uh, another uh, sense in which cultural uh, culture is used is in the way a discipline has formed, this is for your general understanding, uh, is called cultural studies. Cultural studies is uh, something like an academic field grounded in critical theory and literary criticism. Why I'm actually saying it is that culture used to be taken for granted and it was used to be part of uh, historical studies. But cultural studies today, which is more a recent development, is an extension, it's a new, new, new discipline that has, academic discipline that has developed. Uh, so this is only an extension of what I was talking about culture, but uh, cultural studies is a very important field that is related to whether it is cinema, whether it is uh, fine arts, whether it is uh, music, culture, music, theater, anything that you talk about, uh, anything can be included under cultural studies, as well as uh, studying this art is concerned. That's more a historical theoretical premise rather than making uh, practice. Now, uh, we are going to uh, directly focus more on, uh, uh, directly on visual art as we are concerned about visual art more. Uh, primarily, we are concerned about visual art. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you something about mediums and methods that is involved in it's very general because you uh, may be studying it in your studios, uh, these mediums and methods more in a more specific way. But here I'm only kind of trying to make certain distinctions. Now, uh, one is that uh, uh, from prehistoric times, you know, you have uh, 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 certain mediums that are in practice, like painting, sculpture, uh, drawing, sketching, mural, also to a certain extent, printmaking. Now, these could be called as conventional or traditional mediums. <clears throat> that is because there is a continuity of these mediums in through throughout history, right? So when we talk about conventional or traditional mediums, we are talking about uh, a, a, a certain continuity that uh, we see in terms of painting, in terms of paintings, say, I mean, I'm not going into the details of that. Paintings can be, say, on a, uh, on a canvas, on, a, on paper, on, on, a, on a wall, on a scroll. So that kind of specificity I'm not going into but you know from your practice that each of these uh, 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 nomenclature also leads to kind of more, more and more uh, specific uh, mediums and methods. Now, what I'm actually interested in telling you is that uh, modern and contemporary times have <clears throat> definitely added to these uh, uh, apart from the above uh, 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 mediums, you have very many other uh, uh, practices, mediumistic practices that has come about in particularly in 20th century and 21st century. <clears throat> These are 
uh, so during uh, during the cubist period, you you find the development of collage. Uh, I'm not going to, to define this term collage. Most of you would be knowing. If you don't know, please uh, check it out in the dictionary. Or during the Dada surreal period, you have the coming up of assemblage. Uh, assemblage you also find in the in, in in synthetic cubism, but use of found objects also in that uh, times you have so called new multimedia art today these are uh, installation art web art performance art lens based art like photography and video these are things that are uh, uh, used more in in a postmodern context that is contemporary context post 1960s uh, if you want to be more specific about timing. So you have varied uh, methods and uh, uh, mediums that are used in art uh, today, visual art today. So, <clears throat> uh, so having made that distinction, so modern art has made a lot of new uh, uh, innovations with regard to the mediums. Right, so that is one uh, uh, specific uh, uh, category that we may look at. Uh, next distinction that I would like to make is between fine art and craft. Uh, 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 fine art is something that is uh, called as uh, uh, fine because it is very. Uh, uh, sophisticated, very refined, very classical. Uh, 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 these are the kind of this, this descriptions that you can give to fine art. Uh, but in in India, we call it by the word Lalit Kala. You no, know, you know Lalit Kala Academy. That is actually a word directly translated from fine art. But when you compare fine art with craft, how do you dif differentiate between craft and fine art? Because a lot of art you find in today's time are craft manly art, like weaving, embroidery, uh, making anything ceramics, any, any, any functional objects would be put under the term craft. Now, there is another uh, uh, distinction, historical distinction that came about that is to be kept in mind is that India or this subcontinent did not really uh, have this kind of distinction between art and craft. In India, probably we had one word called Kala. Kala is the word. So that could be added to any other uh, word like Nritya Kala, if you want to say dance, if you want to write. Uh, so a lot of uh, 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 art mediums came under the category called, as such, you know, that uh, tradition uh, preserves record of uh, 64 arts, right? Uh, Kama Sutra actually. Uh, 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 mentions about 64 arts and these are all called as uh, kalas or you may also call it you no know, lalit kala is fine art or sundara kala is also fine art but kala in general is a considered to be a generic term as far as india is concerned and it is considered to be a continuum there is no such hard and fast distinction between uh, fine art and craft as far as pre-modern India is concerned. This is a historical fact. We started using fine art and craft as distinct categories after the colonial period. It is the colonial rulers uh, who came to India and ruled India, the British, who have uh, divided this, uh, made this distinction between, or gave us this distinction between fine art and craft. So I hope you are with me. 
when I, I talk about it. <clears throat> now, how do you, how do you, uh, where do you put folk and popular art? Is also a question that is to be thought about in relation to fine art. Do you consider folk art? How do you define folk art, first of all? Folk art is something that is, uh, 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 another term for folk art is uh, rural art. That is, that means that folk art is something of the people in general. Uh, of the people in general, in the sense of uh, common people in general. Uh, agricultural in the pre-modern times, uh, probably even today, uh, folk art is used more in a, in, in, to describe the rural art. Now, this is different from tribal art because tribal is uh, the, uh, of the scheduled tribes that in India we understand it as uh, scheduled tribes. Uh, but uh, largely you have the concentration of tribal art in uh, Africa and oceanic uh, uh, regions. So, so these are again, uh, differentiation, folk is different, tribal is different, but then there is also another term used called popular art. Right, popular is something that can be easily defined as a contemporary phenomenon, or modern phenomenon, you can say, that is due to industrialization and after the coming of the cities, urban modern cities, in the modern period, you have print as a print medium. After coming of print medium, you have uh, popular arts. It is also called kitsch in German. It's a German word, which means uh, low uh, taste, like art of low taste, like the calendars, the cinema posters, etc., etc., etc. So now, so that is uh, uh, one distinction that you you should be following that uh, apart from fine art and craft you should understand that folk is referred to in terms of the rural uh, tribal is referred to in, in terms of uh, the, the 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 gotra we call in malayalam or uh, uh, the, the 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 tribal uh, society now Apart from all these distinctions, there is also a shift that has happened in the more recent times from the use of fine arts. We call very, uh, 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 very commonly that we are in the field of fine arts. But a, a shift has taken place in, in today's time, more contemporarily, that is to call all these as visual art. So we, when you say fine art includes very refined classical art forms largely, whereas visual art, when you say visual art, you include in that folk art, tribal art, craft, popular art, everything, whatever is visually present to you as art. So uh, these are some of the distinctions that uh, we should be keeping in mind while talking about a uh, field called fine art. Now, you need to also think about uh, other categories uh, when we are talking about pre-modern art or uh, uh, art that came up before colonization as far as India is concerned. That is something called classical art, what is also called as margi art. That is a art that is of uh, court or of high religious art. So, Religion is, of course, in tribal society also. That's why I use the term high religious uh, places, like uh, churches and uh, temples or Buddhist monasteries, etc., etc., would be uh, high religious art. Now, which would be different from folk, rural, or tribal. There's also a word which is not very much used these days, is primitive, because if you use the word primitive, it is designating the people as uh, of, a, of a lower development, period of lower development. Now, so uh, classical is something that would be called as uh, uh, margi, as far as Indian, Indian is concerned. 
uh, this is actually a, 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 a term that is uh, used in Natya Shastra. Uh, so people try to define Margi as uh, something to do with uh, the upper, higher order uh, of art making that is classical. And Desi is something which is called as uh, of the people, which do not necessarily follow very strict uh, Shastric rules. So another word for uh, Margi is Shastriya, you know, as far as Indian context is concerned. So <clears throat> now, uh, having defined these very basic uh, terminologies with regard to the sociological uh, implications of various categories like uh, fine art, uh, court art, or uh, classical uh, tribal art, etc., etc., we come to another distinction now. That is to say that uh, another definition now that uh, all over the world, pre-modern or traditional art, that is pre-modern times, that is pre, uh, say, 18th century, or including 18th century, uh, to prehistoric times, a large period. Of course, within that, you will find a lot of uh, divisions uh, in terms of time. But generally, the pre-modern -mo pre or traditional art is part and parcel of the society it belonged to. Now, what I'm trying to say is that art was part and parcel of the people, whoever community that it, it was addressed to, whether it was temple art or church art or folk art or tribal art, wherever art was made in the pre-modern societies, it was part and parcel of the community fabric that there was no need for an art critic, so to say, or an art historian, so to say, to interpret art to the people because people saw it and understood it because it was their shared uh, uh, values, shared beliefs, shared uh, 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 notions about uh, what is, I mean, nobody probably had any problem to recognize a Buddha or a Vishnu or a Shiva or a Christ in and what they are doing in the painting uh, in a, in a, in a pre-modern or traditional societies. Whereas uh, in modern or com contemporary or post-modern phase or contemporary or post-modern phase, uh, we find that art is not so easy for people to follow. Although it has a certain immediate uh, uh, impact on us because we are surrounded by modern or contemporary art or we are in contemporary art, we are in modern art because we are part and parcel of that. Our culture is modern. So we are part and parcel. We are actually in the times when you have binales, we have uh, various galleries that are exhibiting. So contemporary art, modern art is part and parcel of our life. Now, traditional and pre-modern art is slightly removed from us. You have to make an attempt to kind of go and check it out, you know. So uh, please understand the importance of the category modern or contemporary art as distinct from traditional art. Because uh, modern art is a value by itself. It is distinct from the traditional because it's often born out of uh, something that is not uh, able to express, that is, or something that is born out of the suppressed, that was unspeakable. So modern art often tries to, to, to express whatever it is not expressed before. So it often uh, uh, see, it, it, it often manifests itself in terms of its rebellion or in, it, in terms of its revolutionariness. So this is in context. This is in contrast to uh, the traditional art which is understood and shared by uh, all. 
modern art is a little different or majorly different because it uh, it it uh, it it is uh, more uh, exclusive in many ways uh, it also claims avant-garde position that is to say this word avant-garde is very important it is a term that uh, that uh, 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 denotes the progress of modern art that each movement that came up that uh, from impressionism to post impressionism to fauvism to cubism uh, surrealism etc etc they all claim that they are in the four four group they are in the foreground or they are the uh, 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 in the in the, this is a term actually that comes from military uh, terminology which means that the the, the front uh, barriers barriers who are fighting from the front so avant-garde is an uh, is a coinage in the modern times so they claim themselves to be progressed before or be more than the previous uh, uh, stage of development no, modern art, unlike the traditional art, is also very individualistic. Unlike the impersonal aspect of uh, 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 traditional art, that artists did not really bother too much to kind of assert their individuality in any pre-modern uh, societies. It is experimental constantly. It is uh, often trying to transgress or subvert in a sense, break the social norms because it takes on itself that it will kind of uh, challenge the uh, estab est established values or the status quo values. Now, it can often go very obscure. It can be exclusive. It can be very assertive, unlike the, uh, the pre-modern uh, art that was known for everybody. It was shared by everybody. But here, art can be more exclusive for a particular community or can be addressing a certain, certain group of people. It may even look a fad in the sense it can be kind of very pretentious and it can even look very fashionable. Pop art, for instance, came up as a kind of very pop, you know, very, very fashionable kind of uh, art form. Uh, copying or imitating the popular stuff that was amongst people, pop uh, means actually pop. So on the other hand, modern art can also claim social or political commitment. They can claim, I'm not saying that it is political, but they, the artists or the group can claim their political and social uh, commitment. It can also be very populist in the sense that uh, uh, it can be very, uh, uh, you know, catching attention, trying to catch attention. And so it can actually function more in a more populist way. So it can, on one hand, reject the past. That can totally go against past, like Marshall Duchamp drawing a moustache for Mona Lisa. It can, it can reject the past. It can be very blasphemous in the sense. It can be very transgressive in that sense. It can also at the same time reclaim the past. It can bring anything from the past uh, also. It can search for originality. It can claim originality. It, is, uh, it can be, of course, unconventional. It can be a critical intervention into society. Uh, it can be totally irreverent. Irreverent means there is no respect. It can be very blasphemous. It can be challenged the established values. So you are actually belonging to a field of art making that is all this. When you say modern art, you are meaning this, that you are definitely to make interventions. You are definitely to make challenges to the society. It can be anarchic. It can be autocritical, that is, it can be self-critical, like Marshall Duchamp, for instance, criticized art itself, art as an institution itself. So it can be also self-destructive. It can make an art 
that it destroys itself. There are many examples of art being uh, uh, which, which destroys in the process of its uh, exhibition, it's a process of its. Uh, uh, it, it's so. I mean, there is an endless such uh, uh, description that is possible about modern, modern art. I am making that distinction because uh, traditional art had been constantly assertive of the social values, re-establishing the social or religious or political values. It was. Uh, part and parcel of the system, whereas modern art is rebellious. Modern art uh, challenges the, the society uh, or the viewer. Often, you know, so modern and contemporary art had throughout and in general been oppositional to the conventions, anti-establishment, subversive, transgressive, at times autocritical. So this is to sum up what I had been trying to say self-destructive and often it goes uh, it was against itself so what we call as anti-art movement of Dadaism you know is actually included uh, is an aspect of modern art now I'm going to come that, that much only I'm going to kind of give you uh, what you call as more descriptive theoretic things uh, but remaining uh, presentation is going to be more about uh, uh, visuals. So your experience of visual is experiencing visual is very important as far as uh, art is concerned, art history is concerned, or visual art, visual uh, studies is concerned. So uh, I will at the same time while presenting you a lot of visuals, I will also try to kind of make certain sense, certain, uh, I will make you, direct you to think about certain possibilities of, uh, 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 possibilities of categories, understanding things in terms of categories. So, uh, first of all, I want to say is that, that visual is understood in terms of various categories. So that, that's what, uh, you should uh, pr primarily understand to begin with. So uh, the basis of this category making is in terms of time frame, for instance. So there are divisions like ancient art, medieval art, modern art, contemporary art, etc., etc. So we understood certain periods as belonging to ancient art, like Ancient art would mean, uh, 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 as far as West is concerned, Greco-Roman art. Medieval art would be Christian art. So there is also a specific time frame. See, if you talk about Greco-Roman art, then it would be from 4th century BC to about uh, uh, 2nd century AD. Whereas when you talk about uh, Byzantine art or uh, medieval Christian art, you are talking about medieval art. You are talking about, say, 6th century to about 14th century uh, AD, as far as West is concerned. Uh, uh, so you have seen Greek art and uh, um, uh, uh, Byzantine art. Now you are seeing another period, that is Italian Renaissance, uh, art you have uh, that is actually uh, 15th and 16th century. 16th century we have the High Renaissance. This is a painting by Raphael, right? You will see some more. I'm not going into any great details about the painting. Uh, I'm sure you will study as you go ahead in your art history classrooms. But this is basically to say that you classify art in terms of uh, uh, periods, right? So prehistoric period, uh, ancient period, medieval period, Renaissance period, modern period. These are the kind of uh, uh, various periods uh, that we come across. We can also divide art in terms of um, so their qualities, their formal quality. Now, what is formal quality? Form is the way uh, art manifests itself in terms of form, right? So uh, form is, that is what you are actually grasping. 
what is seen in a uh, work of art, either in sculpture or painting or in a print. What you are actually grasping is the form. So the formal qualities, these formal qualities you, you describe in terms of the classical, like in the case of Leonardo da Vinci, or in the mid Madhubani painting as somewhat archaic or somewhat primitive or somewhat naive. Naive is actually a very simple, simple uh, form. Or this Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal rock art that you see, you could describe its form as more archaic form uh, compared to the classical this becomes archaic. This is classical, this is... Uh, uh, uh. Now, <clears throat> so that one distinction in terms of quality. Uh, uh, you can also differentiate art in terms of geography, in terms of geographical distribution as Eastern art, Far Eastern art, you can say, Far East, when you say it is uh, from the Western perspective, Far East would be Chinese, these two works here. Uh, you have Western art, like in the case of Italian Renaissance, Greco Roman art, you know, uh, or Byzantine art, medieval art uh, to Renaissance, you will call it Western art, the Chinese art. You will call this uh, Ajanta painting and uh, Chora uh, period uh, uh, Adhanarishwara, uh, Shiva. These two works would be called as Indian, right? This would be Southeast Asian or this would be uh, uh, South Asian. In the American context, they call it South Asian art. Would be Indian, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that geographical region would be called as South Asian. Uh, but, but whereas in India, we are talking about Indian art here. Uh, these terminologies can, you know, can kind of, uh, uh, there is also a category called Near Eastern, that is from the West point perspective. The Near Eastern would be Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Per, uh, Persian, you know, they, these would be that geography, geography, the art that comes from that geography would be Near Eastern art. Now, art can be divided in terms of religious orientation also. You may be knowing already, but I'm just asserting that a little more. It can be Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, all these various categories can be used. This is an Islamic design. Immediately, because of the formal familiarity, you will uh, call it as uh, Islamic art. This particular work, which is a, a representation of Radha and Krishna, this is actually an example of uh, Viparita Rati, or the exchanging of sexual roles. This is uh, uh, Radha dressed up as Krishna, and Krishna, uh, sorry, Radha dressed up as Krishna and Krishna dressed up as Radha. So this is part of their love play. Now, so immediately you can make out that this is, uh, this is uh, 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 Indian miniature painting of uh, so, such and such period. Now, similarly, you have uh, religions, religious art like the Buddhist uh, art, that has a long history as far as India is concerned. Uh, earliest historical art in India from at least 4th century BC till uh, about 5th century AD is largely predominantly, we um, get to see Buddhist art. Uh, this is Christian uh, art, definitely. This is a Eisenheim uh, crucifixion uh, uh, in 16th, early 16th century. Uh, uh, so, religious uh, category, categorization of art. You can also have ideology as a criteria for defining art. Like, you can have uh, feminist art. You can have uh, uh, propaganda art, art that is made for the propagation of certain ideology. 
you can have communist art, art that uh, you can also have a category of activist art, art that is primarily made for purpose of um, uh, activism, that is to mobilize people into a certain uh, 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 certain uh, social uh, or political purpose. Now, art can be divided in terms of uh, age, like the child art, you see here, or in terms of uh, social growth. Usually the, uh, the, the, the tribal art, it used to be called primitive art. So where the social growth in this uh, 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 is supposed to be more, uh, you know, uh, uh, more rudimentary in their origins. So, uh, or say the folk art that you find, uh, this is Warli painting, this is uh, sculpture from uh, tribal uh, Africa. So uh, you can divide art in terms of their age or social growth. So the, each of these uh, categories, each of these divisions also evoke certain universal formal makeup and thematic content. Now, what I'm trying to say is that uh, when you say tribal art, it would has a certain generic universal quality about them. Formal quality apart, also uh, uh, use or functional uh, uh, universal uh, uh, quality. Say, for instance, ancestral worship is very, 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 very prevalent in, in all the tribal societies, right? Uh, ritual masks, for instance, are universal uh, tribal form, right? So, uh, so each of these categories that we have made. Uh, has a certain u universal formal makeup. They also have a certain thematic content. So the style and subject matter would also uh, uh, would have a certain commonality. So certain general features, general formal features can be understood when you say tribal art or folk art or rural or folk or rural art when you say they are not yet the court type of art, which is more sophisticated, uh, they are more, more naive and uh, more simple in their form, uh, like in the case of uh, Madhubani painting. For instance. So there's a distinction in form between form and uh, pop, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the folk art or the rural art and the tribal art, right? So they, 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 they fall within the kind of a general uh, understanding of uh, formal features, which can be universally ascribed to what we call as uh, folk art or classical art. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, mass art and kitsch art also has a certain formal qualities that is universal. You know, uh, easily described, it would mean if you remember something like Raja Ravi Verma's oleographs or print, uh, printed art, you will see that is a quality of not exactly able to kind of get the quality of oil painting, but far removed from that, that quality. It tries to kind of reach, it kind of try to imitate that, uh, that, uh, that uh, realism. Now, that is one way of looking at it, but of course the use of technology also changes kitsch or mass art. Kitsch is within court. It was so-called kitsch. We no, no more consider it as uh, bad taste, but we consider it as within the uh, within the within the visual culture. Uh, we we consider uh, the popular art or mass art. Mass art is something that is produced for mass consumption. You know that is the specific meaning of mass art. Now, of course, uh, modern art uh, has. Uh, uh, or postmodern art also has a certain commonality because it breaks with the with that uh, uh, illusionistic form largely 
you know cubism for instance kind of totally challenges the uh, or from impressionism onwards you find various uh, attempts in breaking that naturalism so when you say modernism modern art you have a certain common kind of ground uh, of understanding the formal makeup of uh, modern art now <clears throat> this situation we are actually kind of uh, generally are trying to understand uh, art universal art or world art in terms of uh, their qualities their formal qualities or in terms of their content like religious art for instance uh, religious content in art for instance uh, but we need to also understand uh, what is art history distinctions between art history archaeology museology and art criticism actually art criticism should come along with art history archaeology is something so many of you would be knowing already is the discipline that uh, 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 excavates or digs up uh, 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 you know sites or uh, uh, around the monuments and discovers uh, you know the older uh, civilizational uh, you know remains of the uh, earlier civilization so archaeology is a very important part of art history now archaeology is one basic uh, uh, discipline that uh, comes up archaeology unearths the uh, the the art objects or functional objects or whatever objects that were used by people museology or uh, the designs of museum preserves museum museums preserve whatever is uh, collected art history uh, uh, make catalogs initial uh, purpose of art history was to make catalog descriptions what is called as catalog raisonné in french and so along with the catalog you have descriptions description of where it was found what is the material or what is the size what was the purpose what identification of the object etc 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 so that goes into make the larger chunk of art history the conventional art history that we understand is an extension of archaeology museology uh, leading to art history as a specialized discipline by itself and studying art in terms of uh, relationship you know seeing it in a world context in the context of various periods what comes before what comes after uh, stylistic evolution is one aspect of art history one field of study uh, a thematic study is another uh, uh so form and content are the two important uh, areas of study of art history whereas art criticism is a next step that comes in art history is to distinguish art in terms of their quality now if you are presented with uh, a group of 5th century uh, sculptures of gupta period for instance or high renaissance for instance or 16th century you as an art critic you you will be uh, telling us as to which particular work would, is the finest amongst all it is actually critically evaluating a work of art and telling us the relevance of the work of art would be art criticism so art history and art criticism actually go hand in hand they are not exactly separate disciplines but if you go into specialization of uh, uh, curation and stuff like that you will be more an art critic but if you go into more historical uh, analysis of a work of art you will be known uh, uh, for being an art historian now now having actually kind of laid out the kind of basic premises for understanding art now i would like to go into a little more specific uh, uh, terminologies and the, uh, particularly in understanding periods i said art can be divided in terms of periods right so now coming back to that periods how do you differentiate between 
prehistoric period itself has many, many, many layers. You know, prehistoric period is uh, definition of prehistory is that period before human beings started writing. You know, written script. There is no written script existing in the prehistoric time. The historic time that is differentiated from prehistory is this that prehistory do not have writing history historical period you have writing now prehistoric period itself has two major phases one is paleolithic period the cave art in particularly in france and other parts of the world uh, india has also paleolithic period art even uh, this one also the venus of willendorf is different from the Neolithic art, or this Paleolithic art is some uh, art, there is the art that was practiced by people who were into hunting. That was a hunting stage, and that to group hunting. Uh, so their sense of uh, animal or the form is more realistic, even human form, as you can see here. But whereas the Neolithic period is defined in terms of human civilization, people absorbing the practice of agriculture. So slowly leaving uh, the hunting stage to agriculture. This is Paleolithic period uh, example, where from where it is, you don't, you don't have to really bother at this point. But I'm just trying to kind of compare these two examples paleolithic period has more realistic uh, form neolithic period has more schematic form that is simplified form it also neolithic period also has given rise to a lot of uh, pottery pottery was uh, a very important craft the wheel was invented and uh, uh, wheel was a very important invention in the Neolithic period. Agriculture and uh, uh, leading to, you know, wheel, discovery of wheel and uh, pottery. And pottery, the, the most important thing that you see here is uh, the decoration on the pottery is of great importance to uh, art historians. Uh, so you find very simplified schematic uh, decorative designs to human form, which is very schematic uh, in the old period. So just to uh, contrast, in one period, like prehistoric period, you have two major uh, differences in style. Uh, now, next period that comes in art history is the period of river valley civilization. And of course, you have the primacy for this in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Indus. So, uh, uh, ranging from Nile to the, the Indian subcontinent, you, ha you have Euphrates and Tigris. So wherever river valley civilizations grew up, you know, from the agrarian Neolithic period, it developed into more complex social setup with pharaoh and uh, very elaborate systems of practice came up. So earliest is uh, Egyptian. So we have the earliest instance of court art, or you have also earliest instances of religious art. Uh, so you have mythol Egyptian mythology, you, Egyptian gods and goddesses. You, you, it is historic. It is a historic period, right? But at the same time, the script is uh, still kind of pictographic. It is not the. Uh, uh, but uh, Mesopotamia had a, another kind of script. Indus Valley script is still undeciphered. So um, uh, Indus Valley civilization is called proto-historic in the sense since we are not able to still decipher the uh, scriptures. Now certain basic characteristic, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, for the of the formality, formal quality, you find. Uh, there is no much of a greater understanding of realism as we find it later. Art is two-dimensional. You can see flattened uh, paintings have uh, 
uh, the kind of uh, stretched out quality. There is no horizon. There is no source of light, etc., etc. But round sculpture also we find uh, more static quality in Egyptian, in uh, Mesopotamian. These are two examples in Indus Valley. These are Indus Valley ski seals. So you find uh, more frontal static quality in in art, but they are highly ritualistic. They, here is a kind of a man uh, in cross leg position, uh, like a yogic position with uh, this Indus Valley screen, supposed to be an early form of Shiva, the earliest form of Shiva they, they call. This script I was saying that is not decipherable, so it is called proto-historic period. And uh, so, but whereas uh, there is a certain very elaborate uh, knowledge of molding or skill of uh, making uh, has already evolved in the river valley civilization. But it's in the Greek period that you find from an early archaic period that where you don't have much of a uh, movement in the body. Uh, like in this uh, Kuruvo sculpture, the, 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 the static position, much like the, the Egyptian, uh, uh, the counterparts or that evolved, but you have the earliest instance of uh, classical. When you say Greek art is the one which has invented contraposto. Contraposto means the flexion in the body. The ability to show, the sculptor has the ability now to show the movement in the body. Uh, so this is supposed to be a great advancement from the River Valley civilization uh, to a more courtly, uh, more sophisticated classical phase. This is actually a continuation of that in the Roman period. Uh, but next one is actually an extreme case of movement and it's called Baroque. It's also of the third phase of Greek art. Now, starting from here, uh, archaic phase to classical phase to this phase, Greek art had advanced, uh, the Greek sculptors had advanced uh, tremendously in understanding human movement and in carving uh, these. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, great knowledge that uh, art had developed in the first century BC or so. Now, so this is also an invention of realism, convincing foreshortening and convincing uh, proportions, etc, uh, etc. Et apart from movement in the body, that contraposed to that I mentioned, it is also the ability to kind of get human figure in proportion. Uh, human uh, anatomy is uh, uh, well studied. So the basic characteristic of Greek art is established at that point of time. India in 3rd century BC also develops a sophistication. This is necessary to compare and see that how Indian realism is now. Uh, Mauryan art in the 3rd century BC during the time of Chandragupta Maurya or at the time of Ashoka. Uh, the great who assumed Buddhism, uh, Buddhist religion was propagated and of course Buddhist uh, pillars were established. These were, this was a pillar that was uh, on the top of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, this capital was on the top of the pillar. There were several such uh, examples, uh, several such pillars were established with Ashoka Nedik's, uh, uh, Buddha's preachings written on the, this is a sculpture from the Dharganj. It's difficult to identify it. It's called Chauri Bearer. It's a kind of a fly whisk uh, holding a woman. But the, its sensuality is very much, you know, if you compare it with uh, the, the European uh, Greek art, you find this uh, very, in its very beginning, it is establishing a certain Indian quality about it. It has a certain kind of affinity to Indian uh, facial features, I mean, which uh, uh, 
ethnic group etc we may not uh, be able to kind of go into but a certain indian sense of sensuality is established in the in mauryan art now soon after that you have uh, something called archaic period so it is not necessarily that uh, india follows the west in terms of the archaic to classical to baroque but india actually drops into a kind of an archaic phase in second century bc itself uh, in sanchi and bharut two examples you find continued also during kushan period in the third century bc uh, sorry third century ad or second century ad you find this uh, buddha from katra uh, uh, i won't go into the content at this point i'm just talking about periods as far as that. and uh, now the next phase of indian art is uh, what is called as the gupta period both buddhist as well as brahmanical uh, hindu art is found so you have a buddha and you have a so uh, now please remember we mentioned about uh, uh, classical period in greek roman times soon after that in the medieval times starting with about 6th century or so till 14th century ad in europe it had gone into a kind of an archaic phase again as you can see here they forget the inventions in terms of classical uh, contrapposto proportions etc it comes to a very uh, schematic severity uh, uh, in the medieval times at the same time in india there is a continuous development from uh, gupta period onwards through medieval times uh, the very, very same word is used as far as india is concerned the period between 6 to 2 uh, invention invasion of uh, islam so till 14th century we call or even later it's called late medieval times uh this is an example from khajuraho very elaborate temples were made during the that period so that is specific of medieval period so we talk about medieval quality as well as the decoration is concerned so now you need to see it in relation to the classical form that is highly simplified form very uh, you know uh, only what is required most and there is an intimate relation between the the, the body and the, um, the jewelry and the clothes that they wear whereas uh, uh, in in medieval period indian art there is an excess this is what we call as the baroque uh, using the western terminology but it's overtly over decorated the human form becomes less uh, prominent that's not always true though you find in uh, khajuraho etc extreme uh, positions of body uh, flexions in the body etc are very sophisticated so classical is definitely it is but uh, uh, it changes in the kind of a baroque uh, form uh, in terms of its decoration also very elaborate uh, you know temple walls are built this is from karnataka hoysala hoysala style particularly showing hoysala style just to show the the kind of elaboration that comes into existence now in europe if you go back to europe after medieval time there is a resurrection of style you have uh, renaissance art high renaissance art particularly this is uh, uh, leonardo da vinci and this is michelangelo a painting and a sculpture of more or less of the same time and uh, these are two very good example now renaissance is considered to be the beginning of a new era as far as europe is concerned it begins in italy in florence uh, where the artists uh, and the architects reinvents the the lost greek roman so that's why it is called renaissance it is reinvention or uh resurrection of the older form right so this is a particular phase of uh, 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 art remembering the past or bringing the past back into the present so uh, renaissance uh, is considered to be the beginning of a new phase as far as west is concerned it many historians actually relate to modern period to renaissance period because 
a whole lot of uh, yeah, uh, aspects of renaissance like for instance individualism in art or individualism or scientific temper uh, 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 the, the inventions etc etc are found in the renaissance period so which continues in, into the modern period that is why that title uh, renaissance to modern period this is another example of uh, high renaissance this is madonna of rocks by leonardo Da Vinci, you can just simply look at this foreshortening, you will see the kind of, and also the control of light and what he called as fumato. Fumato is the kind of uh, far away land, how it becomes kind of uh, 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 softer and kind of disappears. So perspective, scientific perspective, etc., etc. So great invention uh, during the high renaissance by especially these three artists, uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, Raphael. So it's, it's a brief period which continues in the later uh, period in the 16th, 17th century. There's an in-between period called Mannerist phase, but Baroque is something, uh, it's Velasquez and Rubens here. Uh, uh, you have tremendous mastery over uh, technique by the artists. So this period is described in terms of its uh, great proficiency in uh, uh, art. Now, this is actually what happens in the uh, modern times that you have a stark difference. I'm showing particularly Picasso, which who is inspired by the uh, classical art or pre-modern art, but he uses it for the most revolutionary, most dramatic, uh purpose so a change a shift over of a major break happens in between now that is that uh, i would like to kind of conclude uh, that particular uh, phase uh, that particular uh, 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 discussion about various phases of uh, various time various periods of art history there uh, it's only very preliminary, as you can see, but I would like to kind of make certain other distinctions, come to certain other distinctions. One is uh, the distinction of art being called as icons. Now, icons are different from narratives. So please take note of this fact that icons are uh, having a certain universal formal characteristic starting with egyptian here you have pharaoh and his uh, wife they are pharaohs were considered to be gods or representative of gods uh, so their images are made like that of gods and one of the most important aspect of uh, uh, the the icon is its frontality please make a note of it uh, write it down this word frontality is the most important thing about uh, icon now imagine that you are carving this image from a block of stone. Uh, image is not visualized from all the four sides, but image is primarily visualized from the front. As you can see, that is what is called frontality. It is not imagined from another angle or another angle from, or from behind. Uh, so the archaic quality uh, is maintained in icons. Icons are always frontal because it addresses, icon means actually a very supreme presence, uh, whether, it, whether it is Christ or Vishnu or a pharaoh or a king uh, or even M.G. Ramchandra, uh, you know. Uh, um, so they are all kind of icons or political leaders today. So they are actually people who are to be worshipped or emulated so their their presence is frontal similarly a byzantine icon as you can see is uh, 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 visualized from front and schematic schematically presented very predominant use of uh, you know uh, 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 certain uh, formal ways of kind of making it uh, present you may not actually look for facial expressions and stuff like that here yeah? but what is more important is uh, their iconography i'm introducing another word here 
uh, apart from frontality, their iconography is important uh, because this is Maria and uh, Christ to you identify with certain iconographical details like the nimbus here uh, with the, the scripture here uh, with the particular gesture of teaching as well as uh, as European art is concerned or here the walking as if in the in the heavens or towards the heavens this is resurrection of christ and there's no much of facial expression you can see you are uh, given actually with uh, uh, certain uh, motifs like the the the, the followers uh, of christ and uh, two angels welcoming uh, also a, a, a crucifixion by grunewald a german painter in early 16th century is an icon because it is also visualized primarily from front uh, frontal so as far as india is concerned you have uh, buddhism as i said uh, right at the beginning the earliest uh, formal uh, propagated religion in india is buddhism uh, of course there is vedic religion etc etc before but we don't have images uh, during the vedic or upanishadic period we have a historical period you know during the mauryan and sunga period this is sanchi this is from sanchi stupa uh, pillar torana pillar uh, we have uh, a narrative here we have an icon uh, being represented. This is uh, Buddha, of course, was not uh, uh, physically represented during the Hinayana phase of Buddhism here. Yeah? So the earliest uh, 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 Buddha, Buddha images come only in the second century B AD, but we are in BC now, and the, during the Hinayana phase, you have the worship of uh, this is Bodhi tree. This is actually representing Buddha's enlightenment. That is uh, Buddha achieving. This is a worship. The stupa is the icon here. That is to be worshipped. People worship uh, the icon. So this is also rather frontal. This is a stupa, which is solid inside. This is a torana. This is not the main stupa in Sanchi, but uh, the secondary stupa of, uh, of a disciple, Mughalaya. So we have this Torana and all these de depictions are on these uh, 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 gateways. Or the representation of Dharma Chakra is a representation of his uh, Buddha's uh, first sermon. So uh, Buddha's first teaching is uh, marked by the... So these are un-iconic forms. That is, I'm introducing another word. I said icon. Uh, iconography. Now I am saying an icon because it is not figurative uh, image of Buddha uh, uh, giving the first sermon, but it is symbolic representation of uh, uh, Buddha. Now you have other icons also, like this is earliest uh, one of the earliest uh, representations of Lakshmi. Lakshmi was not uh, uh, appropriated by Vishnu by at this point in time. Vish, uh, uh, Lakshmi was actually a goddess of uh, fertility. And she is uh, adopted by uh, two elephants. And so she is called Gaja Lakshmi. She is seated on the lotus. So these are iconographical details. She holds a lotus. And uh, so uh, this is found in Buddhist stupa. Uh, there are many examples of uh, Sri, Sri Ma Devata also is uh, a, a, a similar goddess like Lakshmi. Now, these are some of the earliest uh, uh, icons of Buddha during the Kushan period, perhaps uh, second century. But right from the first century, you have, uh, first century AD, you have the representation of uh, Buddha. One such is the Bikubala sculpture, which I don't have the example here. Uh, but uh, this is from a place called Katra, and you have uh, seated Buddha. You have 33 Mahapurusha Lakshanas, that is uh, 33 important uh, signs on Buddha's body, including this uh, 
urna, which is in the center of his uh, uh, forehead. There is uh, his ushnisha. Uh, there is uh, like various such, uh, you know, his hands are like ajana bahu, that is touching his knee, etc. Uh, he has webbed fingers. That's also an iconography, like the duck. Uh, that's also an iconographic feature. So he has attenders of Indra and uh, I think it is uh, another Bodhisattva. Uh, so he is on a seated, so specific iconography is followed. He's on Simhasana. Uh, then there is also a representation of Bodhi tree behind it. So this is probably his first sermon. Now that particular form Look at the form, the, the, the kind of uh, excess fatness and the kind of lack of spiritual expression on his uh, uh, face becomes a more spiritualized form uh, in Sarnath by 5th century. So within a kind of an evolution, our historians study this evolution uh, of form uh, from, Sarn uh, from Kushan Buddhas to Sarnath, uh, Gupta period Buddhas, the most, uh, most uh, you know, sophisticated, classical, you can say. This has also a gesture which is called Dharma Chakra Pravartana Mudra. Dharma Chakra, you know, is a wheel. Uh, it is actually the operating of the Dharma Chakra. It is made of two, if you can see me, two, two, two Mudras. Uh, this one is Chin Mudra and the other, the other also is Chin Mudra, one is directed towards oneself and the other is uh, directed out, outward. So it is the kind of teaching oneself and uh, teaching others. You have um, a chakra here. Uh, you have uh, the two, two uh, uh, deers shown here. Uh, very elaborate, uh, you know, uh, nimbus that he has. So these are all his uh, sign of dignity. In Gandhara, which is influenced at the same time, uh, during the Kushan period, by Greek Roman art, uh, uh, he is actually showing chakra being, you know, turning the wheel. So this is also Sarnath. The first sermon is being shown here. So I'm saying that icon has a very elaborate way of telling uh, what it is. Now this is Bhumi's Parsha Mudra. Uh, Buddha is actually touching the earth. This Patmapani and Vajrapani here. So this is Bhumi, this is a particular story that uh, behind this, that uh, 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 Buddha was uh, distracted from his meditation by his enemy called Mara. I'm not going into the details. He said, he, 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 then he, he, he remains unmoved and he calls the Mother Earth by touching the earth, that he calls the Mother Earth to witness his, uh, his uh, what do you call it? yogic power. Now, so this is actually followed, this particular gesture in the icon. So what I'm actually trying to say is that icon in painting or sculpture, you have, painting has a greater possibility of, because Mara, this is Mara here, these are Mara's army trying to kind of distract uh, Buddha, and these are Mara's uh, girls, uh, daughters uh, dancing to distract him. So at that point, he touches the earth, Mother Earth, and calls uh, her to be witnessing his uh, un, uh, you know, shaky uh, mind, his stable mind to uh, this thing. So uh, icons can be, you know, very imposing, as in the case of Shravana Balogala Bahubali. This is a very good example of Maha. This, uh, who is this particular uh, 24th Thankaras, uh, I think Parshwanath, uh, who were meditating and uh, the creepers climbed on him and he was not aware of it because his uh, sense of concentration. And he was a, uh, what do you call a Digambar Jain. So Jainism. Now, there is uh, uh, a category called uniconic form of icons. That is symbolic forms or non-human forms of uh, uh, 
uh, forms of icon. And here we have the Shivalinga. Uh, <coughs> We should keep some time for discussion, I think. This was not mentioned before, so I will quickly go through the next slides. This is uh, Saligrama, uh, a, a stone that is symbolizing Vishnu. If you break it inside, you have a kind of a fossil of a, of a, of a, of a chakra-like form. So it is worshipped by Vaishnavas. Vaishnavites. Now you have uh, icons of this kind, uh, very massive, uh, apart from the Shivalinga that is present in the, uh, this is elephant, uh, 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 which actually is very, very elaborate and complicated iconography, which is uh, uh, supposed to have five faces, one behind and one above. These are not represented. This is the terrific aspect of uh, uh, Shiva. This is the Samyaman aspect of Shiva. This is the, uh, you know, the female, feminine aspect of Shiva. So uh, uh, the, the, the upper part is not uh, visible. Uh, back is actually of Kapila. Uh, so this is uh, Vishnu of sixth century. There are various conventions like this is Gada Devi and Ch 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 uh, Shanka Purusha. Uh, this is uh, Chakra is here and uh, this is Vishnu always wears a uh, Vanamala or the garland made of uh, wild flowers. So he will always have Kiri Tamakuta, that is the crown. So Vishnu, this is a form of Vishnu. I'm just wanting to say that there is iconography and there is iconographic uh, uh, elements in. Uh. Now, before going into that, I want to say that icons, this is a narrative actually. This is not necessarily an icon. This is an icon of Vishnu. This is icon of uh, uh, Vishnu's third avatara, the Varaha avatara. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is having actually a lot of narrative elements in it. Uh, I cannot go into all the narrations, but the whole uh, scenario is, uh, you know, uh, describing various things that happened at that particular point in time, that he is redeeming uh, Mother Earth. This is the Nagaraja, this is the king uh, who had stolen, this Nagaraja who had stolen. And he's trampling that, and this is uh, the king and the queen who patronized him. This is Lakshmi raising a lotus above Vishnu as a parasol, as an umbrella. These are Rishis, Munis, these are Ganga, Jamuna here, uh, also represented. So this is Varuna, who is a uh, uh, god of uh, waters. So there is very elaborate iconography. So what I want to say is that there is no icon which is without narrative. So this is narrative uh, in a very synoptic way. Icons do have, uh, uh, you know, uh, highly, uh, cryptic, highly shorthand, shortened uh, narrative uh, in, 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 it, in there. But Buddhists were the best in narratives because uh, Buddhists had a lot of uh, stories of previous lives of Buddha. This is uh, Mahakapi Jataka. Uh, Buddha was born as a monkey and his rogue uh, cousin brother was jumping on him because uh, Buddha was trying to help uh, other monkeys to cross over. So this rock monkey, his uh, cousin, uh, was trying to break his back, and but he is saved by uh, uh, his followers. Then he, he is seated here. So this form of narrative is kind of ca called as uh, uh, continuous narrative because uh, the, the instance, instance of the same story is uh, uh, many instances of the same story he is included in one space so this is what is called as continuous narrative uh, you have episodic narrative also uh, please note down episodic narrative is one episode it's just one episode this is Maya Devi's dream uh, Maya Devi is uh, dreaming a white elephant before she got pregnant of uh, this is uh, birth scene at Sarnath. Uh, Buddha was born uh, while Maya Devi is standing as a sala bhanjika, touching the on a on a tree, ho holding onto a tree. The child Buddha came out from her hips. Then he took seven steps, etc., etc. 
uh, this is my daily's dream so dream from dream to birth uh, and is shown here this is the an iconic uh, representation of mara's uh, uh mara satak which i mentioned from nagarjuna konda this is uh, uh, buddha supposed to be seated here because he symbolically represented and you have the mara kanyas uh, the daughters of mara enticing him etc etc so this is uh, an example of parinirvana mahaparinirvana tajanta in 5th century huge image of buddha uh, uh, in 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 his final sleep this is another example of mara sorry mahaparinirvana from this is another example of buddha's mahaparinirvana so these are all examples of narrative but in an icon you can have a narrative right so various incidents of buddha's life is actually encapsulated here these are eight major incidents which are counted uh, are shown in one icon so icon and narrative being combined together now you find uh, in hindu context some of the best icons uh, encapsulating the narrative of uh, Nata, nataraja uh this is the nataraja of uh, chora period it the shaiva cult actually kind of develops a particular uh, iconography of uh, shiva which is very sweet and wonderful uh he is the king of dance and he there is uh, kumar swami's uh, article you should read uh, on uh, on, uh, on dance of shiva which uh, symbolically the ignorance is trampled upon the universal fire he holds fire and uh, he creates with the other uh, with the uh, the earliest uh, form of uh, creation of sound and he is holding abhaya mudra and he is uh, holding this gajahasta which is supposed to be removing all the ignorance in its movement so very elaborate uh, iconographical meaning is found in this uh, icon this is gajasura samhara murti of uh, shiva form of shiva it is uh, shiva taking out the skin of an elephant uh, elephant Masha, uh, technical issues are difficult, sir. In some of the students, I think I'm I pretend I'm sir, some sir, some guy, I think I'm doubt, I think I'm doubt, I think I'm doubt, text, I am done in the chat box. Questions on the other side, I don't know, some way to be a pretty girl, I'm going to go to the answer. No, I'm not going to go to the answer. ഓക്കെ ബുദ്ധി okay so buddhist narratives are uh, very elaborate no what was i talking about i don't remember buddhist narrative this side 
okay so i am i am going to continue this i was talking about natraja so there is uh, the icon like lingodbhava murti which is in the chochora and pallava temples you have the very elaborate narrative contained in that one particular icon this is vishnu as varaha going down and this is brahma going up so this is actually showing the primacy of shiva who emerges out of a of a fire linga linga that was of fire so this is uh, uh, a, a synoptic form of uh, narrative in an icon or uh, you can have more elaborate narrative like ravan shaking kailash or ravana anugraha murti it is called sometimes this is uh, ravana shaking kailash the story which is very common but this kailashna temple uh, example is where parvati is leaning back leaning holding on to shiva uh, and uh, made this uh, shown uh, you know running behind so uh, highly uh, corroded but of course this is a more static uh, uh, representation but this particular kailashna temple example is very elaborate so also the representation of narasimha and hiranyakashipu you know uh, very elaborate dance so there there are specific narratives in brahminical uh, art which is uh, more or less uh, uh, you know contained within the frame of uh, you know icon uh, so they are not like buddhist narratives which are very elaborate you know which are uh, you know, continuous narratives uh, but later on it picks up with uh, uh, jain paintings in uh, 11th century to 15th century you have uh, the trishala uh, the, uh, the mother of uh, uh, mahavir is dreaming uh, the conception is supposed to be the conception she sees uh, seven or so auspicious things you know so that is a manuscript tradition but of course the uh, the, the the narrative uh, becomes very elaborate during mughal period particularly during the time of akbar you have akbar nama here you have, you have akbar nama in this you have uh, hamza nama here it's an early akbari period page now these are also episodic they are not uh, continuous narratives like in the earlier indian indian tradition where the same story various parts of the same story is repeated in the in the painting here only one instance one moment of the uh, story is illustrated here now this is a malva painting of uh, putanavada uh, uh, krishna uh, krishna stories uh, this is a continuous narrative of uh, pahadi painting of uh, aghasura uh, without knowing krishna and uh, friends enter into a, a snake and then krishna kills that snake so, aghasura uh, so uh, see this this particular thing two things are happening at two places this is kitu govinda of uh, kangra uh, period of uh, late 18th uh, century this is uh, radha seated here and uh, uh <clears throat> sakhi the friend is reporting to her about krishna that krishna is dallying with the uh, gopis so radha is lonely and it's happening at two places but put together in one painting there could be miles of distance or at least uh, there is uh, more spaces between there but painters actually choose this continuous narrative or simultaneous narrative you can say this is again radha pining for krishna you know there is a beautiful verse in git govinda where she is goes around hugging the darkness thinking that it is krishna so she is very desperate to meet krishna and this is krishna seated in a distance at a distance and sakhi is actually reporting this matter what is happening here to krishna so uh, indian painters have uh, found very elastic way of uh, space you know their uh, sense of uh, uh, narration is very coming from very ancient times so this is this practice of continuous narration so up till the coming of um, uh, british in india this great tradition continued and this is supposed to be the last uh, <coughs> slide 
and where you have uh, <coughs> uh, Madhuvani painting of uh, Krishna Raslila. Uh, so Krishna is seen with each gopis, right? So uh, this that illusion that Krishna creates in Bhagavad Puran. So Krishna is uh, in the center. So I mean, you can actually also flatten the the the, the, the space. Nobody questions about the illusionism here. Uh, everything is beautifully decorated also. Uh, so it communicates to the to the audience. That is most important. Now, uh, so these are these are the things that I want to share with you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. So whoever is there now, if you want to collect some questions and uh, address it to me, I'll be very happy to answer them. Uh, we are already. We can comment. If we, we we missed something like ten minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, still time to me. Uh, uh, all of you, if you have any questions, you please uh, write it down in the chat box so that he can read and... Or anybody wants to directly ask, or it's possible? Yeah. Send it. That is better. Yeah, that's, that's better. That's better because we can save time. Somebody in between, I think Bhagat Singh had said that with that time when the technical problem was there, we could have ex exchanged some discussion. Right? So, yes, Kamika, yes. if you want to say something, please start. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will, because while, while listening to your presentation, uh, let me first of all thank you for this bird's eye view uh, about. Uh, you know the the scenario of uh, art history that we have, uh, and I was thinking about uh, some an, an entirely different issue. Uh, but maybe you can do it as a, another session. Like you know, what is the politics behind, or who creates uh, these terminologies? What are the situations in which political and cultural situations in which art historical terminologies are you know, formed. Because I feel uh, sometimes, w what will a Chinese person uh, uh, talk about himself as Far Eastern? Uh, he will never say, I mean, he or she will never say, I'm a Far Eastern, I mean, uh, a, far, a Chinese art as Far Eastern. He will say Chinese art, perhaps. I don't know what he or she can, you know, would like to. But somehow, art history is written in largely in a Eurocentric model or otherwise we get to know about this Eurocentric models more and um, we often feel, uh, you know, now I feel very difficult to use the term Near Eastern. I, I would like to prefer uh, uh, calling it as uh, Middle East or maybe Middle East is also a difficult term. Maybe because Iraq has a different culture, Syria has different, Egypt has different, all these countries have different, different context and their art itself has some specificity and how can you simply blanket term all this so these are the questions i used to have let's just to toy toy in my mind so uh, i would like to just share uh, this thought with you and i would like to know your response uh, thank you it is a very well uh, known uh, fact that uh, uh, art historians invent these terminologies or historians, right? And no yeah. terminology is uh, ever final or uh, written on the rocks, you know? So it, it, none, none of these are cast in stone in that sense, you know? So uh, you can always change it, uh, challenge it. Uh, if you say that uh, some of these terminologies are uh, Eurocentric, yes, we have already uh, are aware of it, you know. Uh, so in my lecture, I mentioned about this word primitive, you know. Yeah, uh, yes. 
So primitive is not being used. Uh, a more descriptive term like tribal is used. You know, mm. a type mm. that's formed in the tribal organization is called tribal. Art. No need yeah. to write all term something as primitive. You need to come back to more developed. Right. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pakistan is definitely from the Western point of view, European point of view. So mm. you're very Eurocentric about it, and uh, we do may not use uh, such a terminology. But yeah. in certain waters, uh, still that terminology is being used. You know? mm. Like mm. Asian lot say Indian art. Mm. American it say South Asian studies. Yeah. You know? So uh, yeah, yeah. There are these okay. uh, nomenclatural uh, differences. But we being in India, we being the national, from Kubaras Pami's time, we are thinking about India and greater India and all that. Yeah, yeah. So we are still kind of holding on to the older terminology of uh, Indian and greater India. Greater India mm. moves to the South Asia, Southeast Asia. Mm. Mm. No? Yeah. The extension of Indian art outside India. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm. uh, Especially you know, the Buddhist art and all. Yeah. Both are there. Both are yeah. there. Uh, all these neighboring countries. Right. Mm. So, Gandhara yeah. is not actually part of India today, but mm. if you uh, talk about Indian art. If you are teaching Indian art, you cannot avoid teaching Gandharan art, no? Huh, huh. Right, because the Kushana kingdom was extended to Afghanistan and Gandharan region. Mm, right. Mm, mm, yes, yes. So, so yeah. Experience. Now, for instance, uh, Joanna Williams writing on Gupta art. Mm. There was a doubt whether all the art that was uh, discovered from that period was Sponsored or uh, uh, patronized by the kings. Yeah. So huh. He titled her book as uh, Art in Gupta Period. Mm, mm. You know? Art mm. during the Gupta Period. Mm. So it is not actually exactly as dynastic. You know, it is also in India it is to use dynastic names like uh, Chora. Chora art, Pandava art, Pujra Pihara. Mm -hmm. uh, it's problematic because you don't know what is what was the region of Pujra Pihara. Uh -huh. uh -huh. so, okay. Uh, okay. So you say that it will be during the Pujra Pihara times. You know? mm -hmm. Not exactly as by Pujra Pihara. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's one Krishna Kumar from an art historical history background. How do you attribute the predominance of assembled art found object found art in postmodern Indian Ah, uh, uh, this question is actually uh, primarily about conceptual art, you know. I understand there is a great uh, predominance of uh, uh, conceptual art during the postmodern time, that is post the 60s. So, where uh, uh, found object, these are not the same things. Assemblage and found objects are found art are different. Mm -hmm. so found objects are objects that are taken from ordinary use and put it on a pedestal, like bricks or uh, the urinal or anything that is found object. But an assemblage has a collection of various things like paper with a uh, real object to something like that, you know. Assemblage is more like uh, collage, an extension of collage. So uh, I think that is clear. Uh, it is conceptual art that makes it possible that you have uh, uh, that you have assemblage and found object because it is not about creating a painting or the technical uh, uh, greatness of a painting or a sculpture that is important. The concept is important. So the artist tries to find a translation of the concept into, into object, you know, by 
putting there an object like it could be hair like in the case of sheila gowda or her uh, grinding stones to anything you know so it is conceptual art that uh, makes it possible to use found objects more and assemblage is different from found objects i i think krishna kumar if you want to ask anything further please uh, type down your question um uh manu please uh, write down your question manu dominic uh can i start ah speak sir Make it i have, uh, first of all i thank you for coming here and presenting your presentation uh, my question is that uh, actually what is the important of distinguishing all these practices based on their uh, way of uh, style of representation or on its content uh as you said about the continuum of continuum of all these things and then you uh, start telling about the progress of gajravo apart from the technical skills and mastery of that those artists what was their real contribution to the society uh, what was the political and economic condition during that time my real question is that uh, as a teacher what is your stand uh, how we must uh, how the people of this generation are trying to learn from art or doing practices what must our intention or how how we must take all these things of so, all right uh, uh, you are manu right you are manu uh, manu dominic yes okay no, i mean i'm vaguely understanding your question your question is uh, what is the use of learning all these uh, periods and are uh, various art historical phases Uh, in contemporary practice, is that what you are asking? What is the use of yes. learning? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, see, the thing is that uh, artists of today uh, uh, surely must know what was the art that happened before him or her. Uh, there is a there is a richness of history. that one should be it's not it's not only art history that you should learn but also you should know how society functions and various uh, political aspects sociological aspect philosophical aspects a whole lot of knowledge is necessary for a contemporary artist do you agree do you agree to this uh, position that i am yes. taking what is important of distinguishing all these terminology as basic terminologies are necessary to understand terminologies are to understand if i communicate to you what is gupta period or what is archaic you should immediately able to we should be it's part of language right you should be able to immediately recognize what is meant by archaic or what is meant by classical <coughs> you get my point so this is uh, to make uh, our communications better uh and of course knowing things by itself is useful <coughs> you will soon realize that you want to know something more uh, more deeply like you want to know more deeply about uh, german expressionism rather than studying on picasso or rather than studying on khajuraho rather than studying on greco roman art so at that stage definitely you will go deeper into german expressionism you get my point but an overall understanding and terminology to to speak about art and art history is necessary at uh, as a, at, at at any stage at any stage it is required i mean that is the whole purpose of uh, teaching art history in art schools uh, is that uh, you are not just creating craftsmen who are masters uh, of some skills but uh, you are also intellectually uh, grown your intellect is uh, 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 is uh, is developed as part of this uh, studies so that's why art history art history a lot of art history is about terminology and concepts right so i don't know whether uh, my answer is uh, satisfactory to you mr madhu yes sir yes, thank you Uh, arun arun has a question what is the value and role of craftsmen in today's art 
very good question and now how do you evaluate the role of rural craft uh, in this period this is a very elaborate question mr arun uh, this is a very elaborate question to answer in shortly but i would say that craftsman has always lived in the modern times despite the fact that they are reduced to kind of a minor position compared to the elite uh, high art you know like uh, elite high modern art had also disprivileged popular art not just craftsmen right so it is necessary often artists have felt the need for enriching their uh, their uh, their craft their skills by learning it from the craftsmen so you go and learn certain skills this was a modern practice this is how say from picasso onwards uh, probably till uh, gages brahmanyam etc had been doing that learning things from craftsmen in baroda faculty through the 80s uh, many craftsmen were brought to the college you know for, uh, for students to learn various crafts how things are made how things are created how things are painted etc 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 or weaving etc etc so craft had a very important role in the art making right so contemporary art but at the same time uh, uses appropriates the craft uh, and uh, disprivileges the craft so craftsman occupies a uh a uh, lesser importance in the sense of uh, hierarchy so which is a very questionable thing that was questioned by radical painters and sculptors association so today the role of rural craft is a is a very very uh, questionable issue because they have not been raised to the level of uh, high art unlike say the australian uh, aboriginal art the australian aboriginal art fetches equal status along with the contemporary art so that is not happening as far as india is concerned because those who were leading the craft uh, uh, programs in india uh, from craft museum to back to very many um, people who were leaders considered craft manly traditions as somewhat uh, you know lesser than more intellectually um uh, intellectual capital is much more in uh, uh, fine art you get my point so uh, i hope you have i have answered your question in a in a in a briefest possible way arun okay so okay sir okay thank you uh lal k is asking very challenging task to cross section from prehistoric art to contemporary uh, art sir you have done an excellent wonderful presentation thank you very much uh, lal uh, uh, actually it is i feel that it is the experience of so many years of teaching and so many years of uh, uh, dealing with uh, various periods uh, in the classroom that enables such a presentation uh, so i am not i don't have any magical wand um i just kind of uh, uh can do it i think but i could do it better this is the first time i'm presenting something uh, like this next time i do it it a little more a uh, little more uh, better way but good to know that it has been use, useful useful to you any other question any other question is uh, uh, left anybody want to ask any question we have crossed uh, uh, 130 it is 140 now kavita or manoj would you like to say something at this uh, concluding as a concluding remark hello should we say bye bye or hello hello Krishna Kumar says, "Very educative session for a lay person like me." Hello, sir. I'm very proud to have you. Would be your your neighbor in Sama Baroda. Come and meet me, Krishna Kumar. Welcome to you. That is the advantage. Yes. Uh, you know, 
uh, far and wide, uh, the classroom extends itself to, to, to the larger space. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yes. So, uh, anyway, uh, it's uh, time is you know getting late. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a long uh, presentation and uh, two hours. You asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, you know that uh, this this was our first. Uh, I mean. Uh, inaugural talk in the series we i mean we were planning uh, as art in transit anyway uh, you know as kavita said earlier it was a kind of holistic approach and your experience was much beneficial for our students anyway i'm uh, you know uh, uh, yeah thankful to you and all the participants i express my gratitude and also our technical team, uh, Mr. Labib, uh, Mohamed Labib, who managed this uh, live streaming in uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. I express my uh, thanks to him also, and all our colleagues, uh, students, everyone. I'm expressing I mean, you know, my heartfelt thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just putting down my email here. Uh, uh, here. Okay. Uh, in the chat box. In case if any students want to kind of communicate with me about the lecture, I mean, not uh, on any other thing, but about this particular lecture, any question has been asked or uh, uh, if there was any problem of raising the please do uh, write to me and I will give you uh, a response. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. 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 Thanks. okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.